Hey, Dustin, how are you going? Hello, how are you? Yeah, doing all right. Uh, thanks for coming along. Okay, I'm going to introduce you here and then we'll we'll get going. So, um, yeah, welcome, Dustin. So, Dustin's a software engineer in Seattle, uh, where he's been working on an OpenStreetMap software project to support active transport choices. So, um, yeah, well, I'll pass it over to you and uh, take it away. All right, yeah, thanks for uh, the introduction and great to meet you all. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Dustin and uh, I'm based in Seattle where it's currently 6 a.m. So sorry if I mess up some words. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm going to uh, present the, or this talk is about software called AB Street that I work on with uh, some other people listed here. And we'll jump right in. So um, this talk, I'm going to overview uh, the project first and then kind of describe three tools we've built to uh, help citizens talk about uh, cycling infrastructure changes they'd like to see in their city and kind of go from there. Um, so starting with the goals for the project, uh, I guess I want to, to see cities uh, across the world become a lot more or a lot less dependent on um, driving cars around to, to get places. And so uh, this means a lot of things from land use changes to allowing higher density housing, uh, no parking minimums, kind of mixing um, residential and commercial stuff so people don't have to, to go very far to work or for, for groceries. Um, and uh, particularly like promoting walking, biking and public transit in places. Um, then my goals kind of as a software engineer in building this project are uh, like th there is a lot of transportation planning software out there, but some of it's proprietary um, and in fact, like so expensive that uh, you have to get in touch with their sales team to even find out what the license fees are. Um, so I'd, I'd like to make open source alternatives to that. And uh, many years ago, I, I kind of found and fell in love with OpenStreetMap. And so I also want to use this project to really um, promote that platform and 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 uh, convince cities that they should release more public data and, and kind of buy into this, this ecosystem of doing everything transparently. Um, and then I guess the, the final goal with the project is sort of, a, there's a lot of, I think the conversation between um, people advocating for sustainable transportation uh, and everyone else is like a little bit messy sometimes. And so I, I wanna help that discussion kind of move along a bit. Um, so getting into the problem a little bit, um, these are pictures of how the uh, the government in Seattle communicates to people um, about different changes. And so uh, we have things like bus route changes um, and lane rechannelization and uh, kind of uh, building a lid on top of a highway. And so um, if you're lucky, these these web pages will have, you know, they'll actually let you click on the graphic and, and get a full screen version of it. Uh, but sort of they, they leave a lot to, to be desired um, in terms of communication. Like you can't just see how this affects your commute. You can't really see what the changes look like on the ground. Um, you have to, to do a fair bit of interpretation just to understand like what's being proposed here. Um, but one of the, the success cases, uh, there's an open source tool that was built um, a while ago called StreetMix. And if you haven't uh, used this before, you should check it out. It lets you just take a, a one cross section of a road and adjust uh, what's on that road and, and fiddle around with the widths. And this thing has been wildly popular um, among a bunch of different people. And so I, wanna, I want more software uh, in the vein of StreetMix that's easy for anyone to use and great for communication. Um, but going back a bit to the problem, uh, the way that um, advocacy groups in Seattle communicate things like where they want low traffic streets, uh, the state of the art is you know, drawing thick lines on top of Google Maps. And I think we can do a little bit better uh, than this software wise. Um, and then in the extreme case, uh, this was uh, there's a high schooler or somebody when they were in high school in Seattle actually learned um, SketchUp really well, and they did a bunch of really awesome designs about uh, what the, about changes that they'd like to see. And I think a, a newspaper called them their design better than the Department of Transportation's. Um, but I think these people that can like take the time to learn SketchUp in detail are a little bit rare, uh, and so this is an option for everyone. We need something that's a lot easier to, to quickly prototype ideas. Um, and so to that end, I started AB Street. And uh, at this point, AB Street is kind of a, a collection of different uh, tools, all with the same general purpose, but focused on different things. So the first tool I'll talk about is uh, specifically for looking at a city's current bike network and kind of sketching out extensions to it. Um, and so uh, what this thing looks like kind of in the first view, it, it shows you um, just what the bike network looks like today. And actually, um, at Phosphor G, like the past couple of days, I've seen a few other uh, cycling maps that had like much nicer uh, cartography for representing different um, types of cycle lanes. And so I'm, I'm excited to, to try out those ideas here. Uh, but one of the, the things this map um, shows is just the, the different types of cycle infrastructure. Like sometimes you have dedicated trails where things are very nice. And um, sometimes you have uh, cycle lanes on streets uh, with a little bit of protection from traffic. And then sometimes you just have paint. Um, but the difference with this map is if you zoom in, um, you can see what these changes look like uh, in greater detail. So this like north-south road has um, a, a bike lane kind of cuts off in, in one direction, but it's just sort of paint. 
uh, but the east-west thing has um, a cycle lane that's actually uh, protected by by flex posts of some sort. Um, and so this is built from the, the OpenStreetMap separation tags um, and a lot of uh, rendering tricks. Um, the, this map also kind of shows you elevation and context. So this is a, a, contour mil, a contour map built from uh, LiDAR data. And you can see this like route highlighted uh, kind of going diagonally really like nicely cuts through um, all the hills. And there's a lot of hills kind of on either side. Uh, and so um, going back, if we, if we kind of like select that, uh, that diagonal route as a possible way to bike, um, this is an example in uh, along Rainier in Seattle, if you happen to be familiar with the area. And um, so as you can see from the elevation plot, it's like it, it is nicely uh, dodging the hills, but the, the trade-off is that um, like 70%, 75% of the route is along this like high stress road. Uh, and this high stress road happens to be like a, a five lane, practically like highway. Uh, people go very fast and there's there's no dedicated space to, to bike. Um, but if there was, I think it'd be pretty great because you can dodge the hill. So what's the alternative? Um, zooming out a little bit, this is kind of like the full route that uh, that's being shown. Um, but you, you can see this like alternate route being highlighted um, and it has a trade-off. So uh, you know the estimated time, it's about like 11 minutes longer to cycle and you uh, you really have more elevation gain. Um, but you know it's it's basically uh, away from this this big scary road. And so this is the the trade-off a lot of people are forced to make. you know they can uh, they can go the fast way. Um, but ride alongside uh, very high speed traffic, or they can take a longer route um, and possibly pay the cost with hills, uh, but you know maybe be farther away from from danger. And so I, I think this is a, this is a bad trade off. Um, and so uh, one one of the things you can do with this tool is uh, zoom into that representation of the individual lanes, and um, very much inspired by the Street Mix editor, uh, just change around the, the lanes that exist, um, convert things into cycle lanes, uh, take away extra lanes, add protection. Uh, you can do everything like that. Um, but of course, this this is a very long route. If you wanted to do this to every single um, segment of, of Rainier along this whole thing, this will take you a little while. So um, we made a, a new tool to, um, you just can kind of like select the route you want uh, and automatically apply heuristics and say, um, please add bike lanes to both sides. And uh, you, know, you can choose the type of protection that you want. And just based on the existing width of the road and lane configuration, it'll it'll make some guesses about how to do that. Um, and of course, the guesses are wrong, but you can you can go back and use this tool to clean it up. Um, then another thing we can uh, build off this tool. So instead of just um, saying you know this th these changes help my one particular route, uh, you you might want to know how they affect um, other people traveling in the area. So um, in Seattle, we actually have a, a public data source for um, a travel demand model that uh, describes the trips people take. Um, for for work and for uh, for other other things like that, um, and there's a lot of detail in this data set, uh, and so we can do things like calculate mode shift and say, um, what are all of the trips in the area where uh, you know currently they're driving and it's 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 actually like a pretty short trip by driving, and so potentially they could uh, people would consider biking if uh, you know if if some barriers were removed. One of the barriers that this tool is focused on is kind of safety, and so the this uh, the heat map in red kind of shows. Um, the trips in the area, uh, which ones would like to use this this major road um, because it, it's kind of the fastest, least hilly route to to somewhere. Um, but they're they're probably not doing it because it's pretty dangerous. And then um, based on the changes, uh, how many people are likely to to possibly start biking because you've you've made the trip substantially safer. Um, and from this, we can even estimate stuff, get a really rough estimate of stuff like CO two emissions saved um, if these people were able to uh, switch over from from driving to biking. And so this is kind of the the idea is to to really prioritize um, parts of the bike network to, to plan first based on this. Um, so that, that's kind of the first tool based on uh, just a very focused problem of bike network planning. Um, the second tool is a lot more general purpose, and it's, uh, it's a traffic simulation. And um, the example used for advocacy here, we wrote this article about um, taking this neighborhood in Seattle uh, called Broadmoor, which is currently like a, a gated neighborhood, uh, private only to residents there. And during COVID, sort of opening it up to people walking and biking, because it happens to be this great shortcut through um, a place without a lot of alternatives. So, um, right. So I mentioned that uh, AB Street kind of started life as a traffic simulator, and this is sort of what things look like um, in great detail. Uh, so we have like a, an intersection with the traffic signal, um, and the north-south phase is being allowed um, to go. And you can see individual cars, uh, small pedestrians on the sidewalks, and um, some bikes kind of moving around. And uh, the simulation has a uh, I guess uh, it has a lot of caveats with how it's implemented. Um, making a realistic simulation is pretty hard, but I think it's enough to kind of get started with some some applications. Uh, so one of the cool things we can do in a simulation is measure as much data as we want. 
So um, here you have a lot of cars kind of flying through this, this traffic signal, uh, time's going very fast. Um, but as it happens, we can we can measure the delay it takes them to get through the signal and kind of like map it on this uh, this very this like live time series plot here. So it's kind of a data viz trick. Um, then uh, so this proposal that I mentioned to let people like cut through the neighborhood, these are sort of the results of it. Um, so if you make these changes, the uh, this this kind of shows impact on travel time, um, where uh, like a lot of trips that were that previously were very long um, got a lot like had a great savings because. Uh, Taking this um, this shortcut is it really saves a lot of time for people walking and biking. And so, through this through the traffic simulation, we can kind of run a simulation without the changes, run a simulation with the changes, and do um, kind of exact comparison there. Uh, right. So th that's uh, that's the traffic simulation tool. Um, then the uh, I guess the the newest thing that we've been working on, um, and literally like under ten hours have gone into into this tool. It's just a quick prototype. Uh, but in the particularly in the United Kingdom, they're looking at, at um, deploying what's called low traffic neighborhoods a lot, and so um, wanted to, to kind of understand those a little bit better. So um, this first view just kind of estimates uh, what's defined as a neighborhood, um, sort of an area between bounded by by major roads. And so if we click on one of these neighborhoods, um, can kind of get a better picture. So the the roads highlighted in blue are uh, are designated as residential, and so you know they really shouldn't carry a high level of traffic. Uh, the, the large amount of traffic is supposed to stick to the the major roads kind of on the perimeter. And in this case, it's the almost like a pizza uh, shape. These are like two roads on the side. Um, the problem is, uh, if the if the neighbor if the if the major roads kind of back up and have congestion, some drivers might want to cut through the neighborhood and use it as a shortcut. And this is kind of a, a bigger problem now that everybody has a GPS. Um, and so the the route shown in red is one possible um, route through that cuts through the neighborhood. And this is called a, a rat run. Um, and in this case, this is like kind of an unrealistic rat run. Like, who would cut through the neighborhood only to like pop out one street later? Um, this is kind of kind of silly. But uh, the the tool also estimates more realistic rat runs, like this um, example that just like cuts uh, straight north south um, to kind of yeah to to access these these major roads. And so the idea is like people living along the street, you know, they don't want tra uh, high speed traffic like um, you know flying down their street and kind of like. Uh, Right, causing noise pollu noise pollution and, and danger to anybody trying to just like live on these streets. And so, um, in the UK, the the kind of uh, classic fix is to to add these modal filters where um, they just install barriers with uh, some signage, and people walking, biking can get through. And if you're driving, uh, you're not supposed to go this way. Uh, so, the uh, this animation kind of shows what the the tool lets you do. You can click on a segment of the road and then drop one of these barriers, um, just shown as a as a green rectangle. And then um, the calculated rat runs will update based on that. And so um, you can just experiment with placing the filters in different places. And uh, and yeah, kind of see the consequences. And again, I think there's um, there's a lot that can be done with this tool, but uh, just a couple of hours have, have gone into it so far. So this is a early prototype. Um, OK, so uh, stepping back a little bit, um, the just wanted to talk about all of the, the uh, the ecosystem surrounding these tools. So um, as I mentioned, everything's been uh, open source from the start. I think I started this project about three and a half years ago at this point. Um, and uh, everything I've shown you runs um, offline uh, on your desktop, or you can also uh, load it in your web browser. And um, the project is written in Rust. And so uh, that has the nice advantage of compiling to, to WebAssembly, which is why the web browser stuff works. Um, and uh, everything is based on OpenStreetMap uh, for data. And um, some places have extra public data that we use as input. So um, for example, uh, NASA's SRTM and different LIDAR data for, for elevation. Excuse me. Um, things like uh, travel demand models that describe where people uh, live and work so we know which trips to simulate. Um, and then just different data sets uh, to, to get information like parking that are kind of per city. Um, and then uh, so Robin Lovelace, who's given um, a bunch of, I think, a few other talks at, uh, at this conference. Um, has also developed this this package called Avster, and so uh, this lets you take all of the stuff in the R eco in the R data science ecosystem um, for working with travel demand data and uh, get it into a format that can use be that, that can be used with AV Street. Um, and we also have plans to go the other direction and, and take all of the data visualization in AV Street and expose that data to to R to to do other data viz there. Um, so this is kind of a, a growing effort. Um, so uh, how can you use this tool? So um, there's a lot of maps kind of built into AB Street already. Uh, but if the, the one you want is missing, um, you, from the, the interface, you have an option to just import a new map. And so the tool, or the, the AB Street will ask you to, to go to GeoJSON.io and just draw a boundary and then click a button. Um, and then it'll, uh, it'll download from the Overpass API and just sort of do the import uh, right there. 
And you know, depending on the size of the area and your network speed and stuff, um, it'll it'll take a few minutes. But uh, you know, it's a, a reasonably quick way to get started. And then, if you're doing a lot of work in that particular area, um, and you want to to like more easily uh, support that map across releases, just send me the the boundary you use, and I'll add it to the list of imports. Um, so a little bit of detail, details about how all of this works. Um, it's written in the language Rust, which is a, a really um, awesome new systems language that has a, a bit of a learning curve, but once you, you get used to it, it works great. Um, and then a, a lot of the project has actually been spent kind of developing this uh, this user interface library for drawing and, and interacting with stuff. Um, and it's built on top of OpenGL, and then later we, we made it also work with WebGL. Um, and some things that might be a little bit unusual. So uh, the, the maps are just a file, meaning um, there's a, like you, you work in a, a certain study area. So these are like, um, this is Paris kind of chopped up into five pieces. Um, you can't just like scroll over the whole world and immediately see it. You have to, to import a, a particular place. Um, but, so this has a trade-off. Uh, the trade-off is that like once you you pay the, the cost of doing this once, um, you just have a single file uh, that, that kind of has all the data you need. And so you, you never need to hit the network. And so a lot of things can be very fast. Um, and so uh, a lot of, uh, I guess like there are a lot of other details that might be interesting to people here. So um, I've written uh, a couple of, of really detailed articles lately. Um, one, one talks about uh, how to uh, take center lines in OpenStreetMap and turn it into um, really thick roads and, and realistic intersection geometry. And then there's uh, another deep dive into how the, the simulation works. And so you can go check these out if you're interested. Um, but to, uh, to wrap up a little bit, um, in short, uh, this is a, a project with a very massive scope. And so um, if you're interested in uh, promoting active transportation in, in your city and you're, um, or you're interested in the technical side, uh, I could use help with, with literally everything, um, particularly stuff like uh, getting in touch with the people who have the power to take software like this and actually um, enact changes in a particular city, and stuff like product design, you know, taking all these different ideas and really figuring out which ones are, are the most useful uh, in a current place, in a particular place. Um, and these are some different ways of contacting me. Um, and I think I have uh, at least a couple minutes left, and so I want to um, show a demo uh, instead of just slides. Um, so I'm going to load up uh, kind of a region of Seattle and um, start a simulation based on somewhat real data. Uh, and by the way, John, feel free to um, interrupt whenever it's time for questions. I'm not watching time super super carefully, but uh, anyway, so yeah, so this is the um, the Ballard region of Seattle. And um, I'm running time very quickly because there's not a lot of traffic uh, kind of early in the morning. But if we um, zoom in to a particular place, you can kind of see the, the level of detail that AB Street attempts. Um, there's uh, like uh, in, in along the street, uh, anywhere there's parking or like a parking lot, we, we've estimated that there's a lot of people using the, uh, the parking lots. You can see individual intersections and, and lanes kind of have shapes, even when uh, the shape is kind of strange, and sometimes the shape gets very strange. And so I mentioned that article in intersection geometry. It's kind of hard to to come up with uh, realistic answers from OSM center lines all the time. So you can see the attempt. Um, and right, we can find uh, there should be some traffic kind of uh, up here. Yeah, so a lot of people are, are kind of coming in from the, uh, the boundary of the map and trying to take this left turn. Um, and we could... Uh, follow one of the people individually if we want to some, get some uh, statistics on their trip. And um, yeah, so you can kind of follow individual agents. Uh, we could take this road well. Uh, we have um, a couple of like separately mapped bike lanes overlapping the road and uh, based on OSM data. So let's just uh, look at a less crazy area, um, like this crazy inter this crazy intersection. Uh, you know, here, if, if the if this signal timing doesn't look great, you can go, we can go edit it uh, and maybe take away some of the the different stages and um, you know start with something a little bit simpler and so you know this is one of Seattle's crazy intersections how do you actually uh, decide which directions of traffic can go here and how long should it last like I don't know this is what the traffic engineers do but uh, here's a tool where they can they can kind of try ideas quickly um, right so uh, if we let things uh, proceed a little bit longer I'm hoping to just to show you one of the the absolute meltdowns that happens, um, and like the the traffic jams that happen in AB Street are often not realistic, and it's based on um, problems with the uh, with the data, and the problems come from many directions. Um, I think there should be a problem happening here. Yeah, here's a, a another crazy intersection, um, kind of in Fremont, and uh, if you know this in real life, it really does sort of look like this, uh, but because the signal timing policy inferred is, is pretty bad, you have like a lot of traffic, uh, quite a lot of uh, traffic backing up. And so, um, you know, this is unrealistic for 6 a.m. And it's just because the, the signal timing policy is, is, uh, is unrealistic here. 
um, yeah, so that's uh, that's how this tool works. Um, and uh, if I have a moment, I can show you some other stuff. So um, here's the new uh, byte network planning tool that I mentioned. Um, we can do things like uh, pl plot a route. So let's say we're going from here to uh, South Seattle. Um, so you can kind of see that it uh, the route that it chose um, sort of looks like this. And uh, yeah, it looks like actually in terms of safety, it's not too bad. Um, uh, actually, no, it, it puts us on uh, on Beacon, which I actually thought had bike lanes. Uh, let's see. Um, no, apparently not. Yeah, I guess uh, this is just a one-way road. But if we wanted to change this, we could go uh, we could go edit, and uh, you know, say I think like there's parking here right now. What if we wanted this to be a cycle lane? Um, anyway, yeah. So th th these are the sorts of things you can do uh, with the uh, with the different tools. Um, as I mentioned, it's kind of like a a, a broad scope, and so there, there's a lot to kind of show off. But um, I think uh, we can move on to uh, to questions now. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Dustin. That's uh, what an incredible interface. That just that looks so cool. Um, and I, I have to go try that now. So um, we do have a bit of time for questions. So I'll uh, I'll just jump in and ask uh, what people are asking here in the in the in the Venueless platform. So somebody's asking. Uh, they say I'm not an urban planner, so I'm curious to know how your tool compares with other similar tools. Uh, what problems do you solve that others don't? Yeah. So. Um, one one answer is uh, there's not a lot of other tools um, that are available to the public. Uh, so a caveat: I'm also not an urban planner or um, a transportation engineer of any sort. I'm just a programmer really interested in this stuff. Um, but the so as far as I've seen, the only other tools that really kind of help you do urban planning are things like StreetMix that I mentioned um, way in the beginning, which kind of lets you uh, edit just a single cross section of um, of a road at a time. And this is a great visualization tool, but you know, it, it is limited to a single street and you can't see a uh, relation to, to nearby traffic or anything like that. Um, there are some open source traffic simulators that are uh, that are very awesome and well-established like Matsim and Sumo. Um, but these take a fair bit of work to to set up and kind of uh, to get the model from OpenStreetMap imported and cleaned up. Um, and also the the end result is, uh, I would say it's not really great for um, for public communication. It's not really designed to, to look uh, appealing and, and, and obvious how to understand. Um, and then the and so then the thing is like there are some professional uh, professional software used by the industry um, to do to do some of this stuff, but the the license fee is just prohibitively expensive. You basically have to become a professional urban planner uh, and work at a firm in order to even access this stuff. And I don't believe that's how uh, cities sort of you know th I don't believe that's how city planning should be done. Uh, you know, a lot of ordinary citizens also live in cities and should have the power to to kind of do this stuff. Um, and so AB Street tries to fill the, the niche of rapid prototyping. Um, like it's a you know a, a small volunteer effort. Like there's no way that we can compete with the professional stuff. But um, the the point is you can hopefully get started really quickly with AB Street and just start ideas and and uh, get ideas on the table quickly and then you know turn it over to the professionals who can who have access to the uh, to the licensed software and, and use and go from there. Great. Um, can you tell us about the team who worked on this with you? Yes. Um, so uh, yeah. So I guess the sort of first person to to join the team after um, I was working on it for about a year was uh, Yuan Lee, and she was a a user interface and design student at the University of Washington, and just kind of found the project uh, out of nowhere. And I was very surprised because she promptly like uh, dumped in like a you know a year of her time like really working uh, hard with me to to make the interface look good. Um, and uh, yeah, before her involvement, like the the software was a uh, like not only did it look pretty bad, it was it was hard to use. Like every all of the different features were, were shoved into a different screen. There was no uh, organization whatsoever. And so like without her help, like this this project would be in a very sad state. Um, and then I guess roughly a year ago, uh, Michael Kirk um, is a, another independent software developer. He found the project and uh, started contributing um, quite a fair bit of uh, programming help. And then. Um, I guess we've also been going to a bunch of open source hackathons, like through Democracy Lab, and um, gotten a, a bunch of handful of people or help from a handful of people there. Uh, the bike network planning tool that I mentioned has actually also had design help from somebody named Mara Cruz uh, in New York and uh, Chang Lee. And then um, I've mentioned Robin Lovelace from the uh, from the R community. He's he's been promoting this project and uh, been one of the the main users, kind of like driving product changes uh, for for quite a while. So yeah, I'm, I'm super thrilled to have like slowly built up an open source community and like to, to grow it even more. 
Wonderful. Um, is there a workflow to export a proposed change? So if you if I think that adding a bike lane on a particular strip, strip of road and the, stim, the simulator shows a big improvement, how do I show that to people? Uh, I'm working on that right now. So um, the, the edits you make uh, to, the, to the map are kind of saved as just a, a JSON file. And you, you could take that JSON file and just like send it to somebody and tell them to install AB Street and put the file in the right place. But obviously, that's that's shareable. Um, and so the, the goal is, uh, I, I hope in the, in the short term, to, to uh, get a simple server started where you can just upload the JSON to this uh, to this server. And there's not really going to be any like user authentication. It's just like you, you anonymously upload your edits. And uh, it'll hand you back a URL that you can share with somebody so they can load the same thing. Um, and as a very quick workaround, that'll uh, that'll have to do for now. Uh, coming soon. Coming soon. OK, sounds good. Uh, I think we have time for one more quick question. So um, how do you try to make this simulation as realistic as possible? For example, do you validate it with anything like census data or mode split or origin destination data, et cetera? Uh, I do not. Because um, at the moment I'm one person and that's very hard. Uh, so yeah, like I ideally, this, this all of these things would happen. Um, but in fact, I can tell you that like the results from the, coming from the traffic simulation are like always very uh, very dubious. So the thing is like to run an accurate traffic simulation in, in a across a city scale, like you need to know things like traffic signal timing. Um, you know, if it, and and right now AB Street like infers defaults for these kind of things, and there's no public data uh, for how these things are actually timed. Um, and like the, the results of your signal timing really, really affects uh, how how things move around. And so, you know, this is just one example of a problem that that's going to lead to the simulation being inaccurate, um, lack of parking data, uh, bugs in the simulation, bugs in the OpenStreetMap data. Like all of these things will cause validation issues. Um, and then, like even if the simulation was accurate, like comparing it against um, existing uh, data to, to kind of validate does it work, like. I guess the, the simplest answer would be we could um, we could measure throughput along like just the traffic volume along different streets and compare that to like hourly counts that are that are measured. Um, but uh, yeah, so in short, like I haven't attempted to do this. Um, as I mentioned, like AB Street is meant for rapid prototyping. Like you shouldn't trust the results coming out of this, uh, but you can at least use it to to prototype stuff, visualize things, and communicate the ideas. And then you know if the idea seems initially good, you can hand it over to the professionals who knew who know how to do the calibration better than me. Yeah. Great. Well, it's an amazing project. And uh, thanks a lot for sharing it with us today. Re really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks so much. OK, well, thanks a lot, Dustin. Yeah, we'll let you go. And um, yeah, talk to you later. OK. Cheers. Yep. Okay.